the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being much more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This is episode 112, and this week I'm going to talk actually a little bit on either side of the Tudor period because it's a subject I'm really interested in, and we're talking about the Tower Menagerie. The Tower what, huh? Yes, for over 600 years, there was a menagerie or zoo at the Tower of London, and today I'm going to talk about that zoo, and we'll talk a little bit about it in the Tudor period, uh, which was when a couple of big changes happened in the zoo's history, but I'm going to talk about the whole period before and after. So one quick note that Christmas is coming up, and I want to remind you about TudorFair.com, which is my online shop of, I call it lovingly, Tudor swag, right? So you can get things like sneakers with the Anne Boleyn B necklace, kind of iconic um, symbol on it. Um, you can get an umbrella with Elizabeth the First signature on it. There's really super cool stuff there. So TudorFair.com, there's t-shirts, um, boots, purses, bags, mugs, all kinds of stuff. So check that out, tutorfair.com. And then you can also get the Treasures from Bass subscription box there. I launched it about eight or nine months ago. It's a monthly subscription box filled with tutor treats like books, jewelry, special spa-like things, all inspired by tutor history. So it's $39.99 a month. That includes free shipping in the continental U.S., and it is at treasuresfrombest.com. You can find out more information and see sample boxes and learn more. It's a great holiday gift, too. <laughs> so if you visit the Tower of London now, you may notice that there are sculptures of animals, lions and monkeys and other kind of animal installations. So from the 1200s until 1835, England's first zoo was in the Tower of London. We're going to talk today about the history of that zoo. So when you visit now, you're headed into the entrance from Tower Hill, and there's this area that's built up now with cafes, and that's the exact spot where the Tower Menagerie was once housed. As you walk in, take a moment to think about the zebras and the elephants who were uprooted from their homes to be transported to London for the amusement largely of the king. Actually, going back, the very first zoo in England was started by Henry I. He was the fourth son of William the Conqueror, and in 1100, he started a zoo in Oxford. Henry was interested in the stories of wild animals that he heard, and he let it be known that he was really interested in collecting any kinds of strange animals that any other king could send him. Henry's menagerie was used by Henry for him to hunt his animals. He didn't really want to go in and learn about them. He just wanted to release them in order to hunt and then kill them. So later on, evidence has shown that John, King John of the Magna Carta fame, he also tried to start a menagerie as early as the 12 teens. Records show a payment to lion keepers at that time. But the official opening date of the menagerie in London is 1235. And that is when Henry III received a gift of three leopards from the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II, and that was the king's brother-in-law. They were called leopards, but they were actually probably lions, and they were matching the king's heraldry, first displayed by Richard I of the three lions, right? So at that time, saying leopards and lions was kind of interchangeable. So the king put them into the Tower of London for safekeeping, and he decided to start a collection of rare animals the very first zoo. In 1252, so about 17 years later, a Norwegian polar bear arrived. It was a gift from the Norwegian king. They called it a white bear. And it was really expensive to take care of this bear. So to cut down on the expenses, they tied the bear outside near the river with one very brave trainer who had to be with him all the time and allowed the bear to swim in the river to catch his own food. So people who were visiting the city, who were rowing down the river in a boat, may have witnessed the polar bear out in the river fishing. When the bear wasn't fishing, it was muzzled and chained, though. So it probably really enjoyed those rare times when it could go in and hunt and fish. 
The next animal to arrive was the African elephant. And here we have stories about the elephant from Matthew Paris. He was a chronicler. He wrote his great chronicle right around this time period, and it includes tales of the tower elephant. He also drew a picture, an, an image of the animal, which is still quite popular, and which I will have in the show notes. In 1229, he records an alliance between Frederick II, the aforementioned Holy Roman Emperor, and the Sultan of Babylon. And this was sealed, this alliance was sealed by an exchange of gifts. The Sultan's gift was the elephant, which he then gave to Frederick. But that actually isn't the elephant that made it to England. Matthew then talks about the elephant in England. In his chronicle for 1255, he writes, of an elephant in England, about the same time too, an elephant was sent to England by the French king as a present to the king of England. We believe that this was the only elephant ever seen in England or even in the countries on this side of the Alps, wherefore the people flocked together to see this novel sight. Other chronicles also noted its arrival with less detail. The London Chronicle adds that the elephant was a gift from the King of France and arrived during Lent of 1255. Matthew explains that the elephant was the gift from the King of France who had come to own it during his time on crusade. Paris had seen the elephant himself, and in his record, Chronica Majora, which is now at Corpus Christi in Cambridge, he described its features based on his own observations. He says that the elephant was 10 years old, though of course we're not really sure how he knew that, was 10 feet high, grayish black, with a tough hide, and used its trunk to obtain food and drink. It lived in a specially constructed house in the Tower of London. It was 40 feet long by 20 feet wide, and its keeper was named Henry de Flore. It was incredibly expensive to take care of. The cost of the upkeep of the elephant was one and a half times the annual salary of a knight during this period. But the elephant was not meant to live in a cage in the Tower of London, of course, and they also didn't know what to feed it. They fed it wine. It was really not good conditions, and it died after just a few years. The lions did manage to do better in these conditions, and there were lots of of lion cubs born, which is actually in spite of the fact that no one seemed to have any idea how to care for these animals. This was a period where the ideas of wild animals were very complicated. People still believed in dragons, for example. And in some instances, animals were actually presumed to have the same moral compass as humans, which is something that we don't even give to pets today. There's one instance in France in 1457 where a sow and her piglets were literally put on trial for having killed a child. In the trial, it was admitted that no one witnessed the piglets participating in the murder, and so the piglets were found innocent while Mama was killed. One medieval encyclopedia, the Bestiary, or the Book of Beasts, had some very strange ideas indeed about animals. For example, it was believed that the livers of mice got bigger during a full moon. Elephants were believed to live for three centuries with very little desire to reproduce. Some people believe that ostriches liked to eat metal, and so they found ostrich remains with nails in their stomachs. It was a time where people really didn't understand how to care for these animals. So it's actually a wonder that more people weren't actually killed or injured, right? During this time, the animals were kept in this special tower that you needed to cross over a drawbridge to access. It was called the Lion Tower, and it was torn down in the 1800s, and that's where these cafes and such are nowadays. So where do we get all of this early information about the London Menagerie? Well, it comes from our very dear friend, John Stowe, who wrote his great survey of London, and I've talked about him in other episodes and blog posts, and I shall continue to do so because he paints such vivid pictures of Tudor and Elizabethan London. So in his chapter entitled Of Towers and Castles, he writes, But now for the Lion Tower and Lions in England, the original, as I have read, was thus. And this was something that Stowe was writing in the late 16th century, right? So he says, Henry I built his manor of Woodstock with a park, which he walled about with stone seven miles in compass, destroying for the same diverse villages, churches, and chapels, and this was the first park in England. 
He placed therein, besides great store of deer, diverse strange beasts to be kept and nourished, such as were brought to him from far countries, as lions, leopard, linces, porpentines, and such others. More I read that in the year of 1235, Frederick the Emperor sent to Henry III three leopards, in token of his regal shield of arms, wherein three leopards were pictured, since the which time those lions and others have been kept in part of this bulwark now called the Lion Tower, and their keepers there lodged. King Edward II, in the twelfth of his reign, commanded the sheriffs of London to pay to the keepers of the King's Leopard in the Tower of London six pence the day for the sustenance of the leopard, and three halfpence a day for the diet of said keeper, out of the fee farm of the said city. More in the 16th of Edward III, one lion, one lioness, one leopard, and two cat lions in the said tower were committed to the custody of Robert, the son of John Bower. Then he goes on to talk about various point, important dates in the tower history, as well as coinage and minting in the tower. And then he comes back to in the year 1485, which was the Battle of Bosworth, John, Earl of Oxford, was made constable of the tower and had custody of the lions granted to him. Up till this point, the menagerie was only for the king and his very important friends, not the public. In the 1420s, a few people like ambassadors were allowed to visit the menagerie, and by the Tudor period, giving animals was much more popular between kings, and there was this constantly there were constantly new animals going into the menagerie. Henry and Elizabeth both received animals like elephants, for example. Elizabeth opened the menagerie up to the public for the first time. There was a small fee, of course, of money, or interestingly, you could get in for free if you brought with you a cat or dog that could be fed to the lions. When Elizabeth was crowned queen, she orchestrated a bit of a show when she gave a thank you speech when leaving the tower. Of course, the traditional place for monarchs to spend the night before being crowned was in the tower, but it's very hard for her to be there given that her mother had been beheaded there and she had been a prisoner there before. So she gave hearty thanks for having been delivered, like Daniel, from the cruelty of the raging lions. And at that point, supposedly, the lions roared. Perfect timing. James I had the Lion Tower reconstructed in 1604 with an exercise yard that he wanted to use especially to bait the lions with dogs. Then he also built a platform so that he could sit and watch the lions fighting other animals. James also asked the very famous Edward Allen, a Shakespearean actor, he was also a master of the royal game of bears and mastiff dogs, to get him two dogs to fight the lions. The lion actually grabbed the dogs and shook them around like rag dolls, and James's son, the young Prince Henry, begged his father to stop it, and he begged to take care of the surviving dog and make sure that it was it was taken care of. In 1623, James received an elephant from the King of Spain, and he was told that in the winter, the elephant would only drink wine. As I said, people didn't really know how to take care of these animals. They fed beavers, only bread, and this was also a period when James kept in his own personal zoo an actual Native American person. So in the Great Fire of 1666, the animals survived in the tower, but Christopher Wren was tasked with building a new menagerie for them to live in while he wasn't busy with St. Paul's. This is when Christopher Wren was excavating and doing work on building these new parts of the tower, and that's when they found the bones of the supposed princes in the tower lodged down in a, in a stairwell where it was supposed that they had been buried. So that's that how that period relates to the mystery of the princess in the tower. The zookeeper at this time was a man called Robert Gill, who had been part of the menagerie as his family had managed the animals since 1573. So he did seem to have a clue, and he did seem to really care about them. At one point, he petitioned the crown to not let a man called Thomas Ward take the lions on a tour around the country, which was going to be quite profitable, but he didn't want the lions to have to be put through that. But it got more and more popular. More and more people were coming to see the animals, which led to more risks for people. And in 1686, supposedly a Norfolk woman called Mary Jenkinson, she and a friend went to see the lions. That was what they called it, going to see the lions. And the largest one reached out its paw. 
So Mary touches the paw and the lion proceeds to rip her flesh completely off of the bone of her arm. So her arm was amputated and Mary died soon after. So these are the hazards of going to see the lions at the tower. In 1835, the zoo was closed. There was a concern not just with the upkeep of the animals and the nuisance of it in the city, but also the treatment. The RSPCA, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, was founded in 1824. And ideas about animals and how they should be treated and what good conditions were for them were really changing. So most of the animals actually went to the new Regent's Park Zoo, which is where the London Zoo is still. There were better conditions for the animals and caregivers who really understood them. And they gave people a chance to actually learn about the animals under these trained keepers. So I'm going to leave it there for this week. I know we didn't do just strictly Tudor, but I hope you enjoyed this little tour through the history of the tower. And you can kind of imagine our Elizabethan friends being allowed to go visit the tower for the first time and what that would have been like and standing in line with a cat that they may have caught on the street, bringing that to feed to the lions. Um, it's an interesting picture to think about that in your head. So the book recommendation, I've got lots of notes and lots of sources on the website at englandcast.com. The book recommendation is called The Tower Menagerie, The Amazing 600-Year History of the Royal Collection of Wild and Ferocious Beasts Kept at the Tower of London. It's by Roger Hahn. So I have links at the website at englandcast.com with lots of other show notes and pictures of the elephants and, that Matthew Paris drew. So check that out. You can also always get in touch with me through the listener support line at 8016-TESCO or through Twitter at Tesco, T-E-Y-S-K-O, or Facebook.com slash EnglandCast. Remember Treasures from Best as you're starting to think about your Christmas shopping, treasuresfrombest.com and tutorfair.com for all of the tutor themed products and really cool purses, boots, shoes, all kinds of stuff there. So remember that. Thank you so much for listening, and I will be back again in another couple of weeks. Have a good one. Blow, northern wind, a scent for baby sweating. Blow, northern wind, blow, blow, blow. Ich hoor te boord in bouwrebriek, dat soli samli is on sea.